Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm Alan Stoga, Chairman of the Telberg Foundation. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar on the future of Europe. Uh, we're going to spend the next hour talking among ourselves, but also answering questions that you have uh, about Europe, about the condition, about where it's going. The premise of today's conversation is that Europe is under considerable stress from the war, from financial markets, from energy crisis, from looming recession, social unrest, political turmoil, you name it, it's all happening somewhere in Europe right now. And that's on top of the longstanding um, north, south, east, west tensions that have, have, condition, have been a condition of Europe for some time now. The question is whether all of these forces will combine in ways that could produce more Europe or less Europe? Is there a way, is there leadership out there at the national levels, at the, at the regional level, uh, to find a way to turn all of this straw, to be polite, uh, into gold? To lead our thinking, we have uh, two friends of Telberg and experts with enormous experience in both diplomacy and politics on national as well as European scale. Uh, you will see Anna Palacio and Jakob Hallgren's um, resumes in the chat. Uh, but just very briefly, Anna was Spain's foreign minister. She's been a member of the European Parliament, a member of the Spanish Parliament, and she's an international lawyer specializing in uh, EU and international law. Jakob Hallgren is director of Sweden's Institute of International Affairs and a seasoned diplomat with extensive experience um, in Europe and beyond. As I said, the plan is for us to have an initial conversation. It is by definition on the record. We are recording it. Uh, use the Q&A function to ask questions or make comments, and, and we'll get to them. And, and, and don't wait. As, as things occur to you, start typing. Um, let me add one thing. This is not in the first instance, a conversation about the war in Ukraine. Um, we'll do that some other time, but today the question, one of the questions on the table is, what are the implications of the war as it has evolved on Europe, on the major, and on, on the European countries in general? And, and we will get to that. Now to start, uh, Jakob, let's frame today's conversation first from a Swedish perspective. How confident are you that all of the stresses I've described can be managed? And let me caveat that. I know you're not speaking on behalf of Sweden and Anna is obviously not speaking on behalf of Spain. So you're in your own capacities, but to the question. Well, first of all, thanks Alan for this opportunity. Uh, great to be able to be with you under your able and great uh, leadership uh, on a on a great and, and <laughs> to say the least uh, pressing uh, topic here here today. Well, well, I think we need to be reminded, uh, and I think that's certainly very much part of the Swedish narrative. Of uh, I, uh, you said we're not going to talk about uh, uh, the war in Ukraine, but it's certainly the war in Ukraine and Russia's aggression, uh, stepped up aggression that has created this situation and all the stresses that you're talking about. But but let not let's not uh, forget about the completely and unprecedented unity that this has displayed across uh, Europe in the spring and over the summer and the I think now I believe now eight uh, sanction uh, packages and what this has uh, created in terms of stepped up uh, defense uh, uh, spending and, and various types of collaboration, which has made uh, European uh, Union member states forget some of the, some of the previous uh, disaccords and, and uh, disunities. Uh, so I think that is important to remember as a backdrop, but it is also of course true that there are a lot of uh, potential uh, problems and a lot of uh, huge challenges looming on the horizon. I mean, you mentioned uh, a couple of them, but uh, obviously the energy issues comes to mind as one of the more pressing ones because one's, uh, one's individuals need to pay uh, electricity bills which go way beyond what they can afford. They'll start 
to to complain and they start to wonder what is what is what, what is our national government and what are what is Europe as a whole doing to 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 us uh, essentially so I, I think as far as I'm concerned and as I think Sweden is concerned uh, there is a huge empathy and sympathy with the plight uh, that the that the Ukrainian uh, people is enduring right now and there is a I'd say deep seated uh, and gen genuine anger uh, about uh, the way uh, uh, Moscow and Russia is is. Uh, uh, is behaving in 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 Ukraine, and and that at least, as far as I can tell, at least from the Swedish perspective, you know, it's, you know, makes us uh, you know sticks us uh, to, together, and 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 makes us uh, you know willing to to endure uh, quite a lot. But uh, as I alluded to, there are obviously potential limits to that that you can uh, imagine. I I think uh, you know. This is clearly a an existential crisis and a crisis at the magnitude that I don't think we have seen uh, for a very long time. The biggest war in Europe since the since the uh, Second World War. Our uh, new uh, newly appointed uh, defense minister said that this is the most serious security situation that we're facing since the Second World War in the in the Nordic region in in in, in Sweden, uh, etc. But but I, I take some confidence in, uh, and, 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 uh, in, in the fact that if you look at the way Europe has dealt with some earlier crises, and I'm thinking about the financial crisis in 2008, and I'm thinking about uh, uh, the pandemic, well, it wasn't nice. Uh, it was kind of uh, chaotic. It was certainly uh, riddled with a lot of sometimes uncomfortable, uncomfortable uh, compromises. But but Europe actually managed to get its act together and 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 to wave uh, wave through that and 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 actually uh, survive. Uh, you know, stronger in 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 some ways. And uh, you know, we're not naive here about the uh, risks for. Uh, you know disintegration and the risk that the cohesion will not uh, stay but 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 i i think i'm at the end of the day at least so far well time will tell and and sweden will uh, assume the role as the presidency of the european union in in january but but i i am still uh, cautiously on the optimistic side that that europe will be able to 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 deal with these challenges and these crises so i'll i'll start uh, there or we'll stop there as a as a first intervention thanks um, thank you um, it's certainly the case that um, both of your countries both sweden and spain uh, are known for their pro-European stances. They're, you're, you're all in when it comes to Europe in terms of national commitments. Um, and it is also the case that during the crises of the last decade or so, and I'm thinking back to Greece, I'm thinking back to the tensions, will the Euro survive, et cetera. Um, Europe has, has, has in fact both managed those crises well and emerged stronger, although you use the word existential, um, the nature of this crisis may be somewhat more profound. Anna, how are you looking at it from this sort of 60,000 foot perspective? Well, uh, thank you, Alan, and it's a great pleasure. And by the way, I will start by something which is uh, interesting, is that after Sweden, the presidency of the European Union will be held by Spain in the second semester of 2023. So there will be a succession of the Czech Republic, Sweden, and Spain. Um, I will pick up two of expressions that, that Jakob has used and support them. I think that Europeans have surprised even ourselves by the unity that we, have, that we are having, at least until today, behind Ukraine. That's the, my first, uh, my second, I mean, pick up from his interesting uh, intervention is that this is a crisis of a different magnitude, different magnitude than we, what, whatever we have had until today. And I will go to some two other terms that you have, that you have used. The first is uh, leadership, and the second is this idea of more Europe or not more Europe. And my uh, my reasoning will go in an analysis of um, maybe a different Europe, 
maybe a different Europe. Why? Well, the first thing is that uh, if we concentrate on what has been the engine of the European construction, the Germany and France, the, the tandem, Germany and France, we see that this, this engine is sputtering now. There are clear, clear tensions and clear tensions that in what concerns the future of, of, of the European Union, they, they uh, lead two different strands. In the, in the Charles University speech, uh, Chancellor uh, Schultz highlighted the idea that we had to, to approach uh, enlargement. Uh, why Macron has brought this idea of a community, a political community that by the way, it's, it's an old idea that has been circulating that uh, in, uh, in, the, in after the fall of the world, Berlin Wall, uh, Mitterrand put on the table in order not to enlarge uh, NATO and not to enlarge the European Union, but to have a different construction more on the, I mean, more following the, the 46 Zurich speech by, uh, by Churchill, this idea of, of a Europe, but a different Europe that, okay, until now has been the Council of Europe. So here we have two perspectives. One is enlarge, the other one is create a different kind of organization. And in the middle, you have the European Commission, the, the, I mean, the speech of the State of the Union by the President of the European Commission, where von der Leyen said, we need to reform the treaties. We need to convene a, a convention and reform the treaties. Okay, you know, <laughs> with this, we have to go one step further. We know that there are clear tensions between, uh, between Germany and France that they oppose. Oh. They, there are differences in energy, Today, and I will mention the very salient points today that made that the, the bilateral meeting of the two governments was postponed, that it, at the last moment they convened this meeting between the two, the two maybe uh, Macron and, and Scholz. Uh, but uh, we have energy, Jacob has highlighted, it is extremely important. We have the positioning of Europe vis-a-vis -vis China, which is also extremely important. And third, we have this idea of how to build European defense. And these are areas where France and Germany today do not, uh, do not have, I mean, are in opposite, in opposite uh, or are going in opposite directions. So first is the second thing, and I, I think it's extremely interesting that Tolberg is a, is a Swedish foundation. I'm coming from Riga, from the, the, the Security of Defense of Riga, the yearly meeting of Riga. And what, what I see is a poll of just of initiative led by the Nordics with the Baltics and, uh, and the, the, the core of it being Baltics and Nordics with a speech that in summary would, would be the West is back, the East is in trouble, the South is divided, and we are resilient, we are for democracy, we are for, for human rights, and here we stand. And uh, uh, remember the publics of the foreign affairs minister asking in Berlin to the, to the Germans saying, well, I, I'm not sure that we can trust the Germans. We, 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 Latvians, we are ready to die for Europe. Are you? So, honestly, more Europe at this moment, it's complicated to see how all this will in the end, uh, just will in the end come together. Because I think it will come together. Why? Because, and this is my first mention, explicit mention of Ukraine, Ukraine has put us against the wall. We cannot just go on dragging feet and saying, 
as as Benita Ferrero Wallner in 25 of, uh, in, in, in 2005 said uh, precisely in uh, in Kiev uh, when asked about the enlargement of the European Union saying, well, you know, the door is not open, but the door is not closed. What is a door that is not open, but is not closed? Well, there is no, no door. So I think that we have been procrastinating. We have, have been, um, I mean, muddling through, uh, trying to, to just keep things on, a, on the back burner with, with Ukraine. Uh, I think that we will have to take positions. And this is why I said at the beginning that I see a different Europe. I don't see an enlargement of 35 chapters. And after you have negotiated the 35 chapters one day, from one day to the next, the, the flag of the said country just joins the other flag. I think that we are going to do, we, we, are, we will have to, to go a more pragmatic way. Um, just for reference, we have connected Ukraine before connect to the to the European grid to the European grid in uh, in March. Before we have we connected the Baltic countries to the European grid, which means that you know we are confronted with the situation, and we are taking uh, steps, practical steps, and we will have to take more of these practical steps uh, just in different areas. Uh, of course, say, uh, energy is one, uh, security is another, is another one. One last comment though. though. Uh, here we are speaking a lot uh, in the transatlantic uh, community about reconstruction of Ukraine. And this will be an important chapter of, of all this. I'm not saying, of course, we have the Balkans that are there. By the way, uh, we started negotiating with uh, Albania after we, we, we declare Ukraine a candidate. So Ukraine is, is shaking the boat. And when you shake the boat, and there I join Jacob, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm a realist, but I'm an optimist. I think things will happen. Uh, pragmatic things. And what we need is to, uh, in, in my opinion today, to get back to a common approach, France and Germany, because if not, it will be extremely different. And uh, uh, France, France and Germany, uh, not, not exactly aligned. They have never been exactly, exactly aligned, but in an understanding that they are lacking today and that will be uh, very bad. One last comment. It's obvious that the, the center of gravity of the European Union has gone north and east. And the center of activity, of drive, of strength is absolutely in the northeast. Is, as I said, is this pole where you been of the Baltics with the, with the Nordics, with a bit, if you allow me, I know that you are sweet, but I'm, 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 a Spani I'm Spanish, but sometimes from this position of high moral ground that you take, that's, that's where we are. Of course, with Poland there, that is not exactly in the same pole, but it's in the same drive and other Eastern and Central, uh, and Eastern European countries, members of, of the fifth enlargement. We in the South, in Spain particularly, we are very eccentric, absolutely eccentric. And this is something that is a, should be a concern for all of us because yes, Russia is where, where Russia is, but, and we in Spain, we don't have this sensitivity vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis Russia because for us, Russia is Dr. Zivago and Tchaikovsky and, a little more, you know, for our countrymen. It's that, we don't, we haven't had a history with, with Russia, but you don't know the Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean is not just about immigration or refugees. The Mediterranean is about Wagner, it's about the Sahel, it's about security. So 
we need to keep this idea of NATO 360 and, to, and we need to keep, a, of course, a focus today on Russia, of course, a focus today on the East, but we cannot forget the Mediterranean. So Anna, that's an incredibly robust set of issues. We could be here for the rest of the week um, parsing them, but I wanna focus on two. One you mentioned, one you implicitly mentioned. And let me start with the latter. Um, it has been one of the flags of Europe for years that uh, the, the mantra of soft power, that Europe was going to lead at a global level to the development of its soft power defined differently by different people. But it's been clear watching what has happened to military commitments in many countries, that it was at the cost of hard power. That in fact, for all practical purposes, Germany disarmed uh, France really close to disarming other than their nuclear capacity. Um, and it's been spotlighted, obviously, by the war in Ukraine. Uh, and we've had new commitments from the Germans and others to that we, we, we now have to bulk up. We now actually need some kind of serious uh, rearmament. Um, put aside for a second whether that is within NATO or next to NATO, That's those are critical issues which we won't have time to get to. But is it do you think fair, and, and it's to either of you, either question, either of you to respond, is it fair to say that the overemphasis on soft power has been uh, revealed as not such a great idea by the Putin aggression in the, in the East? Jakob? Um, well, um, I mean, there's many people who say that, that uh, uh, the um, that that Europe relied on China for production and, and the United States for for security, uh, etc. And I, I am mean, that's maybe a little bit exaggerated, but there's certainly certainly an element of of of, of a truth uh, in that there was uh, you know either an ignorance or maybe naivete uh, of 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 the risks that have been uh, displayed so so clearly by by Russia's uh, behavior. Uh, but and also by by China's uh, behavior, uh, by by the way, um, so so uh, I mean, there might be some some truth in that, and I think this is uh, resulting in a in a new realization that that uh, I mean I can only talk about about Sweden as example as a very strong uh, free trade uh, proponent, which we will always remain to be at at heart. But we also realize, and I think the pandemic already showed that that. Uh, you know, production, value uh, chains, uh, and, uh, and and so on, uh, needs to be reliable, and they they weren't, uh, and and uh, this is related to issues about key uh, technologies that we are critically reliant uh, uh, about, uh, and and that of course leads me to to the issue of defense that you that you uh, mentioned. Um, I mean, I've already mentioned how commitments for increased uh, defense spending are, uh, are everywhere in, in Europe, and there is a renewed commitment to, to look into uh, how well, at least joint procurement in defense can happen in, in Europe. And I think there is also a whole new, uh, you have to correct me, Alan, but but uh, acceptance from the United States that, that Europe actually invests in joint platforms, et cetera, in order to strengthen its uh, uh, defense. I think the ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, illustration of this uh, new realization of, of new geopolitical uh, realities where Europe needs to, uh, you know, take on a firmer stance is Finland's and Sweden's application to, to join uh, NATO. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Russia uh, is not allowing uh, countries uh, to choose their own courses of security uh, uh, identity and, and systems uh, uh, any, any longer. And we draw the conclusions uh, from that. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think there is a realization that that, you know, Tendency to focus more on soft power than hard power has been has been rebalanced to to uh, more of an investment in, in in hard power, but but I I want to say that uh, finally maybe that when it comes to to hard power the transatlantic link is and everybody realizes that uh, indispensable. Uh, I mean this uh, conflict has shown how that link has been 
reactivated and uh, revitalized in ways we didn't think were possible uh, a couple of years ago when I think it was uh, Macron said, uh, President Macron said that NATO was brain dead, etc. That's certainly not the case any longer. So Europe, yes, but in very strong collaboration uh, across the Atlantic uh, uh, as well. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Well, if I, if I can just put on the table my two cents. <clears throat> First on soft power and then on defense. On soft power, you know, I mean, we have gone the soft power route uh, to the dismay of many of us. Uh, and, but this was, I, I mean, when you speak with Germans, Germans today feel on the defensive and they think that it's Germany bashing because in the end, the, the, the army that really was not an army in, the, in, a, I mean, in an operative sense is Germany. And the culture that was not a defense culture was Germany. And the, the foreign affairs pol uh, policy that was not a foreign affairs, but just a trade policy was Germany. And all this has been brewing there up uh, Together with the idea that the French was uh, the French were nuclear power had their own seat at the security at the security council, so there was not a real interest in this in this uh, engine to go forward in anything that was not soft power. But at the same time, honestly, I think that we have to remember that yes under the, um, the security umbrella provided by the United States, but the, the reunification of Germany was done soft power way, and the enlargement was done soft power way. And I mean, we have been discussing with our German friends for years that they could not, that the, this Ostpolitik of Wandel der Hartnell was not was not a sensible one, but they would respond to you, okay, well, this is what has happened. So right now we are confronted with a different, with a different situation, but we cannot forget what was the situation when, uh, when Europe was preaching soft power under the very comfortable umbrella of the United States. Now on defense, I, there what we have is that Germany in this Zeitenwende that I, I, we need to see how it will be, it will be not materialized, but they, the, the, the Chancellor Scholz has announced 100,000 billion, uh, 100 billion, billion for, um, for, for the army. Yet uh, the first thing that Germany does is to organize a mi missile shield excluding France. I mean, let's be clear. I understand that France cannot, just cannot, cannot see how Germany is excluding the biggest, the best arm, the, the best performing uh, uh, military in, in Europe. And then Germany buys, buys, buys uh, American instead of buying European. And, so on and so on. So again, I think that all this is a matter of being at a turning point and uh, needing to uh, needing to, to, to sit down and see that it's not about soft power any, any longer, that it's politics stupid and that because it's politics, we need defense and we need a foreign policy and we need Germany to think European, because this is the other issue that is happening now. Germany, until now, I mean, during, before reunification, Germany looked for its interest within the European interest. We have gone for many years, we have lived in a German Europe where really Germany decided about refugees and we accepted. Germany decided about Nord Stream 1 and 2 contrary to the founding principles of the, of the European Energy Union, Germany, so whatever Germany wanted, 
Germany got in the European Union, which was a different aspect. But now what we are seeing is that Germany is going solo. Germany, uh, Macron invited uh, Merkel to the meeting that he organized with Xi Jinping, but uh, now Scholz, instead of waiting as Macron wanted, is going there by himself. And he, I think that Germany right now is sending a message in this, in the limit of uh, gas prices, in anything that the I kind of, we have done, and uh, we have done the, the next generation funding, and now we need to concentrate on us. And this concentrating on us, Germany, means 200 billion to help our companies, whatever this, the consequences for internal market is. And this means I go and I see Xi Jinping and I sell Hamburg and I do whatever. And this is extremely, uh, extremely dangerous. It's also extremely important because going back to the idea of a different Europe, as you've just said, uh, Germany to a considerable extent, Germany and France together to some extent have been, if not the driving force, that's probably the wrong way to put it, but have been the, the leaders of, of the, the engine of, of this. Um, they've decided how far, how fast and where, and we'll, a week from now, we'll talk to we'll talk Germany and France in more detail. Um, but certainly, if as you just said, the Germans are headed off on their own, if the Franco-German relationship isn't what it has been in the past, um, it does raise an existential question for where Europe goes. Who's going to make the decisions? Is it um, wh who's in that engine? Um, I defend Germany for a second in the sense that they're probably a bit shell-shocked right now. Their entire global strategy is in tatters. Uh, the dependence on Russian energy, you pointed out, uh, turned out to be not such a hot idea. Um, they outsourced, as you said, their security to, to the United States, and now they have to do something about that. Um, they are hyper-dependent industrially on China more than any of the other European countries. And as you've just described, Schultz is headed there by himself. Um, and it looks like trying to, to enhance that relationship, the German relationship, not the European relationship. So turn that into a question for you, Jakob. Um, if Germany's not leading Europe, uh, I guess there's two aspects to it. Um, how do you get them back on side? And is, is perhaps the first one. And the second one is what happens if, as Anna has suggested, they are now on a path to handle, to, to focus on themselves at the expense of Europe? Um, sorry, sorry, Alan, I didn't say that. I, what I meant, at least what I meant is exactly what you have said. Uh, Germany right now is in disarray. Germany right now is confused. Germany right now is doing Brownian movements. We, we, what we have to expect and hope for is a Germany coming back to its senses, to its senses with its power and, but to its senses of understanding that it cannot go solo. So I don't think that this is for the future. Just this, this note, because uh, I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm a believer. And again, uh, you know, Germany has been the, the tractor of many of these initiatives uh, that have benefited among other, I mean, all Europe, including Germany. But right now it's the moment for the rest of the, of the European Union to, to show solidarity and to show understanding. And we have, because the mess of the energy is of German manufacturing. It's not Spain, it's not Sweden, it, it's Germany basically, and we are trying to, to get there. What we need is that uh, Germany just, as I said, uh, goes back to, to a, a normal uh, mode, because right now they are in an ab abnormal, extraordinary mode. Jakob? Uh, well, uh, no, I, I, I agree with uh, the examples which were mentioned uh, here. Uh, you know, going alone to 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 China and 
and uh, discussion about uh, uh, where to buy weapons, uh, etc. But so I, I mean, very, I mean, I, I do agree uh, that uh, Germany is probably in a in a state of confusion, and and I, I tend to agree with you, Alan, that that we must maybe understand that the magnitude and the the uh, you know the degree to which uh, German attitudes shifted uh, extremely quickly this uh, this spring is uh, is unprecedented from from German points of of, of view. Uh, I, I remember a time uh, not so long ago where everybody asked for Germany to form a foreign policy and to to be more assertive and and to actually take a stance in Europe and to, to step up in every possible way. And they, they are now doing that. Uh, and in some ways, they are receiving a lot of critique for, for initiatives they're taking in one way or another. But I mean, I, I believe they're sufficiently embedded in and, and, and loyal to the European ideas that they will, they will listen to that and, 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 and adapt. Uh, I mean, uh, some uh, good decisions were taken uh, or uh, initiatives or indications were coming out of the European Council uh, last week, I believe, on how to deal with with, uh, with uh, Ukraine as we go forward with energy, uh, gas prices, etc., and also uh, with, with China. So I, I, I think they will listen and that they will... Uh, they will uh, um, you know, adapt uh, and also lead because uh, talking about leadership, it's Europe in which needs to lead, but Germany needs to lead together with France, of course. I, I fully agree with that. It's when the French uh, German engine, when that works, that, that Europe uh, moves forward. Sometimes we think that that is going too quickly and maybe in a federalist uh, uh, direction too much for, uh, for a Nordic uh, taste. And we're certainly also always quite uh, uh, um, you know, careful when increased lending is uh, or or uh, you know borrowing is is coming up, uh, but but it it I I I think uh, it's moving in in the it will be moving in the di right direction. As as I said before, the compromises and the way they reach the compromises is not always very uh, beautiful. But given the the stakes, uh, the existential nature of the of the stakes here, I think they'll. Uh, they'll come to agree in, a, in an acceptable way. And, and Sweden will once again, just like Spain, be in the uh, fortunate or so, or not so fortunate, let's see how it will be to, uh, situation to, to lead this in the next uh, six months. Um, let's talk economics and politics just for a moment. Um, we're clearly headed into what could be a severe recession in Europe, uh, at least the forecasters insist. Uh, there are inflationary pressures more or less everywhere. Um, the social safety net is under some pressure. It's the, the subsidies, in fact, the subsidies that Germany has announced for its people and companies have, have really <laughs> focused the region's attention on why are the Germans playing at, at a European level? Why are, why are we suffering more? Um, but put all of that together with political winds blowing in countries like Sweden, like Italy, um, towards giving more uh, power to the, to the right, whether it's far right or center right, we could debate some other time, but you, you clearly have populism um, becoming more popular. And, and I would argue it's partly because of the crummy economic conditions and we're about to have them become much worse. So how much, and in Spain, of course, you, you have a, a complicated political situation as well, where you do worry about what's going on, um, not in the center, but in, in, in the right and the left. So to what extent are you concerned that this economic tsunami, which seems to be coming at us, seems to be coming at Europe, um, is going to push politics into directions that are less collaborative, that are less trying to solve regional problems or even global problems and more focused on, 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 on the home, more focused on the the local politics than on, on these bigger questions. 
Well, uh, I mean, the the risk is certainly there, and the scenarios could be could easily be portrayed uh, in the direction you you just uh, uh, did. But but I would still <coughs> argue that at least speaking about, about Sweden, it, it it might be might be described as as populist, but it's also fiercely uh, you know pro European and uh, you know. Uh, uh, colored by an insight that for some of the bigger issues, it's really only joined to bigger European solutions, which uh, can uh, can uh, you know address some of these challenges, with you know notable uh, exceptions. Uh, and and there is also a you know talking about the local politics here, uh, there was a you know quite a lot of anger about uh, you know fuel prices and things like that which uh, which carried these parties to 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 uh, to the majority so i think there is also an a wish to really address those issues both at the national and 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 the european uh, level but yeah of course the, the risks are there that we will disintegrate into less collaborative behaviors but but you know, i think that what is happening in 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 ukraine and the the russian behavior there is quite sobering and if you if you consider that that's what's stake essentially all of our core uh, values everything uh, we we believe in whether it is uh, the you know, human rights and, and you know, uh, democracy and all the, the values that is underpinning this collaboration. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can never rule out anything, but but at least as I read it, there is a, a strong wish to 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 make it work. work. It might be a rocky ride. I fully agree with that, uh, but uh, but I, I I fully see that. But I, but I still think that they will come round and take the necessary responsibility. One of the consequences, and I just want let me connect to God here. One of the consequences of Ukraine, of the war, have been 5 million uh, Ukrainian refugees flocking into Europe um, and frankly being extremely well treated, um, allowed to work, um, supported, not just in the bordering country, Poland stepped up immediately, but throughout much of Europe. Uh, there's a question uh, from one of the, one of the, from the audience that doesn't take that dot, but takes the climate realities. The climate is obviously going to the climate, the continuing climate warming is going to generate more migration, not less migration. Uh, Europe has been struggling. You mentioned earlier um, Chancellor Merkel's decision to open the borders briefly. Uh, migration has been an issue that has been complicated for Europe as Europe and for individual European countries. Uh, so we do have this Ukraine experience, very positive, but it has also raised a lot of criticism. Why are you letting Ukrainians in, but not Syrians and not Tunisians and not uh, Africans, et cetera? So how do you square that circle? How, Anna, does Europe... Uh, honestly, for me, it? it's because this is, this is us. I mean, this is, this is Europe. This is democracy. This is our democracy. This is the survival of the European Union as such. Ukraine is, has brought to us back uh, the awareness of our values. It's, it's a different story. We, this is not a matter of immigration. This is a matter of, of just participating in a fight that they are dying for, but it is our fight. And this is what citizens in Europe perceive. And, uh, and this, this, I mean, this is what it is. In a way, um, Ukraine has brought us back epic. La Chanson de Roland, El Cantar del Mio Cid, Tristan and Isolde, all this is today Ukraine. It's, it's our, as I say, it's our fight. They are dying for us. It, this sentiment, and this is the feeling that citizens have. This is a different feeling. The, the, the feeling for a refugee is a feeling for compassion, but it's not a feeling of, you know, um, your, your, your fight is my fight. No, it's, uh, these are difficult circumstances. We need to address them, but it, we cannot equate. Uh, the, the, the circumstances are different. I think that if something has been very clear that European citizens have instinctively understood that the aim 
for Putin is not Ukraine. It starts in Ukraine, but it's, it's just undermining our system of democracy and just uh, I mean disembodying, uh, disembodying the European Union. So this is why uh, normal people, because this is not governments, this is not policies, this is normal people. This is normal pe people uh, uh, understanding. As I said before, I cannot, I don't know how to express it better. They are fighting, they are dying for our, uh, just for our principles, for our uh, values and for our future. I fully agree with that. And I mean, hence, uh, the sanctions against uh, Russia and all of the support to, to Ukraine, but also the, the generosity to, to, to receive those, uh, those Ukrainians when they choose to, to leave their country for a while or, or you know, for, for, for longer. And that is, there's such, an, uh, di there is such a direct link to the feeling that they are essentially defending our, our way of, of, of life. Uh, and let me also add, I mean, we're not forgetting uh, the Mediterranean and, and, and you know, needs in, in Southern Europe or South of the European Union uh, for, for, for that matter. And I, and I, I do agree that, that uh, some of the kind of uh, moral high ground or, or policies or initiatives are, are um, driven from Eastern Europe, maybe now, to some extent also Northern uh, Europe. But that is because there was a feeling that they were right the whole time. And we're talking about how representatives from the Baltic countries, from Poland and other Eastern European countries have talked about the, the risks that we're now seeing being materialized for so long. And, and when that is happening, there is kind of an, an unprecedented and enormous uh, generosity that flows up directly linked to that and linked to, to the fear and the anger of, of, of Russian behavior, I would say. So it's a whole different magnitude. And, and, and I, I, of course, fully agree with the, the risks that, that climate uh, poses. Uh, it pushes uh, climate uh, migration, and it also uh, uh, highlights the issue of, of, of European uh, green uh, trans transition here. Somehow, since this big issue with Ukraine is now so existential and so front and, and center, that is where all of the resources and the attention go right now, I would say. So let me, I, I tried to avoid too much on Ukraine, but let me ask the obvious question. What if, and it is hypothetical, you may not want to answer it, what if there's a significant reversal on the ground and the Russians once again are conquering territory, wrecking havoc throughout the country, um, moving towards even more aggression within Ukraine. Um, Anna, you had a, you, you, your, your passionate response was, was absolutely wonderful, but at what point, or could there be a point when it's not enough simply to stand on the sideline and say, We'll give you anything you need, but we will not fight. Uh, but, isn't that exactly exactly the where the soft power and the hard power meet each other? And if you don't yeah. have hard power, I mean, isn't that the issue? Eh? I mean, Alan, if you what if, if you, what if Ukraine loses? Will that motivate a different European approach to Russia? Well, frankly, Alan, if you put difficult questions on the table, what if Trump? wins in 2024. This is the first question that, that Europeans are asking themselves. Will, uh, will the, the friendship of President Trump that has been just publicized with Putin change the position of the United States? Will this, what about the midterms with the core of, of Republican uh, Trumpists that will be elected uh, just change not the defense policy because this is the the your your president is the the I mean is the head of the armies he's the commander in chief the commander in chief but uh, what will change so the future brings all kinds of questions i mean i frankly i think that what we have to to address is today and do as much as we can and stand as much as we can uh, behind 
uh, behind Ukraine in a concerted way, which is the NATO way. I honestly, I want, I hate, uh, I hate, uh, I don't have a crystal ball and I, I really hate to speculate on Trump winning or the House and the Senate taken by uh, Trumpists, I mean, by Republican with a dominant Trumpist uh, uh, core or just uh, Ukraine. It may happen. All this may happen. And you know what? We will try to address it as we have uh, until now in NATO with a common agreement uh, assessing the facts. For today, I think that we have a unity on, uh, on an approach. If the circumstances change, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for myself as a citizen of the European Union, what I want above all, and this is why my question mark on Trump is so important for us Europeans, uh, I want first and foremost unity among us. Um, let me use that reference to our ex-president and hopefully not our future president uh, for an advertisement. On November 16th, we're going to do a Telberg program on the midterms uh, with a couple of American political consultants and analysts, pollsters, exactly to look at the question of first, what happened? Second, what does it mean in this interregnum before the 24 elections? And finally, um, very early, what, it, what what might the elections look like? Uh, Michael, you one, sent us- One last word, if you allow me, one last word. We need the United States. I mean, we really need, uh, the, we Europeans, I think that for the moment, and I, I, I'm sure that that Jacob will agree with me, we need you guys. I mean, I, when I said what was said in Riga, that I agree is the West is bad. And the West means, America with allies, but America. I um, fully agree with that. I already said it several times. It's uh, it's key, and the way the transatlantic relation has been revitalized over this uh, last half year is is or almost a year now is is quite uh, incredible. I must say. Uh, Michael, you in the you asked questions about Poland, or you said something about Poland and Turkey. Um, we've talked a bit about Poland. We haven't talked at all about Turkey. It is one of, it's not, a, it's not a big elephant in the room, it's a small elephant in the room, perhaps. Um, how are you seeing these things? Well, I, I meant to, uh, when I said the Poland and Turkey, I meant also to add, if I, if I could, uh, the question of whether the role of Poland, uh, controversial within the EU, but arming strongly and passing the two and three year and 4%, what that will do to German, Polish relations and also, by the way, the triangle between uh, France, Germany and, and Poland, because I think that the Polish factor is going to be very important, not just for us. But leaving that aside, uh, I had in mind... Well, we're going to run out of you. time. Let, let, let's stay with Poland because we're, we're getting yeah. near the witching hour. And, and we yeah, have... Okay. It's been wonderful to have an hour conversation about Europe and the word Brexit has not been mentioned. Um, that's a real accomplishment, which a year or two ago we could not have done. So there's some upside to this horrible war. Yeah. Um, but it does raise the question, and your point about Poland raises the question, and you've already talked, we've talked about the shift in political gravity in Europe, east and, and north. And it is precisely the question of the role of Poland, um, perhaps joining France and Germany and thinking about what does what, what is the future of Europe in terms of the engines um that's asking a lot of the polls i think but they don't think so mm. um how as we can we use michael's question anna and jake jacob to think a bit for the last couple minutes about about that question of, of the rise of the east within the eu uh, was... uh, maybe I, I could start very briefly but i, I think we're still seeing the adaptation of uh, member state uh, relations within the union after uh, the UK uh, leaving. Uh, I mean, Sweden, for one, was, uh, you know, at a loss for a while. I mean, where's our free trade uh, friend and how should we now relate to to an even stronger Germany when uh, one of the other big ones was uh, gone? Gone. Uh, I recently saw an interesting uh, article or reference in, in, in the French media alluding to what you just said, how 
uh, in France, there are thoughts now about how to increase and inten intensify bonds with, with Poland. And as I mentioned before, uh, you know, Poland and some of the other countries in that region were morally right. I mean, there are some necessary shifts taking place here in the way the countries, uh, remaining countries within the Union are, are relating to each other due to the fact that the UK left and due to the new realities. We haven't seen the end of, of, of that yet. And, and as Anna was alluding to before, maybe there is, will be a need to kind of balancing a, you know, shell-shocked or whatever confused Germany at, as it finds its, its new place in this, in this uh, wider EU collaboration. So that would be my thoughts. Just if you allow me one sentence, Please. what is important in this Brexit issue is that we fear that Brexit will be contagious. And the truth of the matter is that even parties, and I'm, I'm thinking, of the uh, French uh, uh, Front National, so the Le Pen pa party, uh, before Brexit were uh, wanted to exit the European Union, and now nobody wants to exit it. But there are different approaches to the European Union. This, this is important. Now, second, uh, Poland will undoubtedly uh, play an important role. But again, for me, the discovery is this poll of Nordics, Nordics, by the way, where, where Sweden is playing a, a, a plaque tournant, a kind of uh, just a, a cement of, of this, but where uh, in many ways Finland has been brought with the importance of the Arctic that we haven't mentioned, but that is there. It's one of the big issues that we should address. For me, this is extremely important. And I think that the drive that I have seen in Riga, the, this, the, you know, in, in many ways, that, this counts a lot when in a community there is a group, someone that has a clear idea of where to go, eh, you, you can run with that. You can run a lot. And of course, in this package, uh, Poland is there in, in some areas, leading in other areas, following. I, I have been, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really very interested in seeing how all this develops in this idea of the, this Baltics or, or Swedish uh, just being the, the center of a, of a Nordic plus Baltics uh, just initiative. Um, driver of the of the future of the union. So we have um, endless issues that we've opened. I'm not sure we've closed any. I do like the idea, which really has been a common in, in what you've said, both of you have said, that there's a different Europe evolving um, for all sorts of reasons, not the least Brexit, but for all sorts of reasons. Uh, it's a work in progress. It isn't, by framing it more or less Europe, we're not gonna get very far, different Europe and, and how that different Europe might work, uh, the relationship to China, the relationship to the United States, um, regardless of who's president, but certainly if, if one person in particular is president, one wonders what might happen. Um, we're gonna talk about a lot of that in the second installment of, of this conversation, which will occur a week from now. Um, there we will, have a, a couple of people from France and Germany uh, talking about France and Germany, but also all of these other issues. So hopefully everybody can join us for that. Um, again, as I said, we'll get to the United States after these midterm elections in, in mid-November, um, and we'll be scheduling a couple of, 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 of programs on the continuing war and its consequence. What I'd like to do in, in, we're over time, and, and I don't like being over time, but to ask Jacob and Anna if you have uh, last thoughts. You've given it's so many be, thoughts already, I'm yeah. not sure which. which it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a, a tough struggle, but I think the sense uh, that there are existential issues at place where about play whether it is the european values democracy way of life uh, ultimately 
peace because European Union is actually a peace project, uh, that those will prevail. For me, my last thought is that uh, the weak link is the public opinion. Is the public opinion maybe not in the East, not in the center, not in the Baltics, but the public opinion in, uh, in Italy, in Spain, where, where, we, where we don't have this understanding that you have mentioned of Russia. I think that we have to make everything possible to stick together. Uh, this is our future. The weak link is there and we need to overcome that. Uh, and do whatever it takes to keep these this, uh, this citizens all over Europe engaged in, in this common project where that now has been shaken by a, by a, by a I mean, an existential, which is what is an existential war. And they have to, to keep, to keep the, the drive and it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy for sure if the economy is as bad as some think it will be, um, if countries continue to focus on their own internal needs, not the collective needs, um, and indeed if the war goes badly. Um, so we are facing a whole series of, of uh, headwinds, um, and we'll have to revisit this not just next week in this in our second installment, but over the next month. So thank uh, all of you in the audience who spent the last hour with us. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, greatly appreciated. Thank, thank you. Alan. Thank, you. Fantastic. thank you, Alan. Always. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the to the foundation. Thank you, Anna.